Hello? Communication. We're ready. Can we have a key? Okay. Mm, no. Women's love is so friendly. Women's love like herbal tea. Women's love it empowers me. I just want to manipulate my girlfriend. I just want to play it with her head. I want her to do the metal push ups. I want her to apologize to Becky so soon. So wrong. I feel guilty as fuck. Do I quit? I can't help it. Get us in jump my lousy luck. Yeah, it smells like dyke in here, you know? <laughs> I'm a social defect. If it's a sin, if it's a wrong, it sure is fun being a social reject. There's always going to be queers in, you know, like the Midwest or the South that are very isolated. I, you know, I was one of them, and I know how that feels, and it would have made all the difference in the world to me had there been, like, an out band at that time when, when I, you know, was 16. It, or even like, or even for bands to say they're queer positive, it would have just been like, wow, it's acknowledged. It's like I exist, you know, just to even be um, acknowledged as 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 like a person that you know takes up space. And then so you know when we play, it's like yeah, I want the dykes to take up all the space in this club, in this hall. bottom line is it's really important for women to use different forms of media to uh, make a new girl culture. Yes. <laughs> Duh. The first people we met that we had some kind of connection with, I would say, would be Leslie and Tracy, who are in ASF, and now Leslie's in Tribe 8. And they came to Toronto in 1986, 7? Yeah, they're in a band called ASF. In a ASF. band called ASF. anti Yeah. And we met them, and... And, and all... The only dykes that I knew of were like these softball dykes down in Denver who used to like just go to the club and watch videotapes of Martina Navratilova or this was me in 1991 this is me now 1995 I mean I've gone through some vast changes since then but when I was in, you know, high school, that picture and things like that, I was totally in drag. For me, it was drag, you know. For me, it was like, God, you know, lipstick, eyeliner, mascara, honey, got the hair gel. What else did I have? Pantyhose. I was in speech and debate. Got my first tattoo. Had it hidden under that dress. And I didn't have, like, a nice little southern girl hairstyle, and I wasn't going to join the junior league and I wasn't going to get married, and all of that was really obvious. Okay, let's take a portrait of all of us. Okay, come on. <laughs> Look, I was the only girl in my high school that was playing rock, but I don't think that I was very aware of myself as being a girl, so that might have actually helped me. But then, 
It stopped helping me. <laughs> You're gonna have a sex change when you grow up. What are you, oh. boy or girl? Only straight girls wear dresses. Only straight girls wear dresses, it read upon the stall While the dyke who rode must not have a brain at all I got all perturbed, yes I got mighty mad At all the assumptions made about my clan What I've written and what we've written I think is stuff that we've always wanted to hear but haven't And I knew not to say anything about it. Um, I came out when I was 16. And I got beat up the next day. Mom, there's something I've been wanting to talk to you about for quite a while now. As a matter of fact, like about 10 years. Um, yeah. Remember that letter? I got caught several different times with girls before the age of 12, and all three of them were really traumatic experiences where, you know, like one time we had to leave town, and one time this girl got sent away, and, you know, really big things. And this, they were always with girls in my class situation, so it was this really weird thing, because growing up on welfare, you're really, you know, you're taught to... to, to you're always under the threat of being taken away from your family. Your mother's going to be taken away, or you're going to be taken away, you're going to be separated, you're going to go to a home, you're going to go to jail, you're going to, you know, there's this constant threat of somebody coming into your home and separating you. So I, I really tried to start dealing with this separation I was making between class and sexuality, and these instances that happened that were really exciting and wonderful in my childhood, like that despite having an abuse history, I was also able to, like, be in my body and, like, have pleasure and really look at another girl and think you're really important and wonderful. Mm -hmm. But then, you know, hit 15 and become a heterosexual. Like, for all the people that have marched and worked on the gay rights thing, I can walk down the street holding my girlfriend's hand and mm -hmm. it's somewhat accepted, you know? And then when I said all that stuff too Friday night, I was like, you know, I wonder if the straight people in the audience who thought that I was like good, like, wow, you're a really good drummer, are saying, oh, you know what I mean? Well, she's a dyke, no wonder. I want a little girl holding it. A little girl what? Please. Holding it, please. Holding what? Holding the camera. Holding the camera? Yeah. <laughs> Ooh. Esperanza was a young girl who dreamed of other little girls kissing on her. Esperanza knew she didn't want to be anybody's husband, she didn't want to be anybody's wife. She didn't want to be uh, one of those peaceable, like, lesbian, pacifist people she sees on the national public television talk show. She knew she didn't want to be no Lizzie, prostitute, addict, case, hardship on the street. What she wanted to be was a fiercely independent homosexual woman. But she didn't have a picture of that in her head.
always dreamed about being in a band. Like, they were my, my imaginary friends. They were my bandmates when I was, like, you know, eight. <laughs> I guess, I guess, like, you know, we were, like, the kinks or something. I played in this band called The Cunts with these three other dykes, and I'd never really hung out with other dykes before. And, um, except my girlfriend. But we figured that we were the only ones in the world. When I was first playing punk, it, there wasn't, at least I wasn't aware of the dyke scene in the punk scene. I only knew the straight boys, and also I was drinking and using a lot, and I just hung out with the people that had drugs, basically. You know, whoever I got a hold of, that's who I hung out with, kind of thing, and it was... So I think that I was, um, unfortunately, in a place where I had to kind of prove myself with the boys, or I felt that way, also being real butch and stuff, you know. So I did start, I did play with Dykes from the very beginning, but, um, but I did not play for dykes. I played for straight people in the beginning. So I guess that's how people knew me from all different areas of the music scene. It's the clubs you played, were they like more oh, no. just like... There were like straight clubs. Okay, and we would, but then you're and, following... But, but, the yeah, our following that's would come great. and sort of freak out the owners <laughs> because they had no idea, you know, they, they thought they were booking three, you know, women musicians, you know, okay. but they didn't know that we were like advertising in our community. Right. And all of a sudden there'd be a lineup of dykes at the door and they'd be like... So I joined this band as their bass player and did all these shows where like we would get on with bands like Sweaty Nipples, hi, a bunch of boys who like, who like sing about sweaty nipples or their dicks or something and like they actually I knew them those were like guys I grew up with and stuff and like, they're really gross and then like did I join this band and we were playing for crowds with them because those were like the only music people I knew like the only scene that was available to me because I just was from Portland Oregon of course and like and like people like these big dudes with like long hair would stand in front of our shows going dykes fucking lesbians and like spitting at us. Occasionally like, you know, the big macho punk guy would be like, hey, you know, uh, he'd get a little drunk and he'd be like, you know, I see this, you know, guy and, you know, don't tell anyone and I know that you won't, but I just, you know, blah, blah, blah. And, and, and people would come out to us and it was really kind of, you know, it was sort of sweet in a way because, but at the same time, you know, everyone was really closeted and, you know, girls would do the same thing and say, you know, we had a friend who was just like, yeah, you know, the other night I get really drunk and I slept with this, you know, girl and, but, you know, I don't want to be a lesbian. If you're a lesbian, you play softball or you read lots of, you know, dry political literature. Right. dykes around have been rioting in their own way for years and now they say, what? Come and ask me. <laughs> Let's riot the thing. And when, when I describe it, they go, because they don't read the music papers, so they don't know, you know, they just have heard about it and say, that sounds just like what we do. <laughs> Except that the music's a bit noisy for me. <laughs> So weird. People talk to me about uh, women's music. People talk to me about punk rock. Well, both of those things were a big part of my growing up. Right. Well, that's, that's like equally, good. equally so. And I probably wouldn't have had one 
I don't know what it would be like to have one without the other. Yeah. I watch people that, have, that are out, that are just coming out in the music world now, coming out as lesbians that didn't have a political lesbian yeah. youth at all. They're coming out from a completely different context. When I was probably 18, I was the lonely dyke in Olympia. I heard about G.B. Jones in Toronto. She wrote something for a magazine, and I was like, oh my god, there's another dyke in the world. Whatever, so I just immediately wrote her, and then she sent me back a, her first fifth column album. And then ever since then, we were being became pen pals. She changed my life. Um, Don, are you aware of the huge influence and impact that your fanzine Chainsaw had on, on, on girls and me? It's like, it's just like, no. It did on me, Donna. Kaya, if it wasn't for Chainsaw, I wouldn't know, I wouldn't know you. I, we, we, I mean, Which is the whole reason why I did Chainsaw in the first place, is so I could meet somebody like you, because I was just living in Olympia, the only dyke that I knew. Uh, it's about choosing your own family when you're gay, because you have to because probably your own family didn't treat you very well. say without being romantic that that punk rock did change my life at this point in the early 80s like when I was about 18 and um, in terms of like finding a community of people that I could relate to even though maybe the, the class affiliation was imaginary and people were being downwardly mobile and I was just being <laughs> but um, it was by far the most diverse group of people that I'd ever had access to and that the music was really important to me and I loved going to shows. I just kind of want to change the, the notion of, you know, music just being one thing, I guess, like, like that's considered, you know, women's music and like punk can't be considered women's music or something mm -hmm. like that and just different and also different dynamics within punk, like, because I'm black, I can't like punk. Right. I mean, I've I've heard that a lot from different people and it just it just shows me their ignorance and yeah. they have no idea of origins of, of just rock and rock and roll. It's boring for me to talk about about punk because it's kind of like something that happened in in the seventies like what you're talking about. But I was so dumb and bored and like fucked up and wanted an excuse to like drink and like hang out with people that were not born to do stuff that I would do things like color my hair. Like. They were all like depressed and you know just kind of desperate and just like fuck you know that that kill energy and then it's like so cool because that's how I felt mm -hmm. you know and I totally connected it was like immediate connection and I mm -hmm. felt like bonded with this music because of what like from X what Xine was singing about you know like her songs were really just about her life Plain and simple, we're desperate, we're drunk, we're poor, we have to move from this house because we, you know, have thousands of dollars back rent. I mean, it's just very real. And it Punk rock was how I came out. I mean, that's what made it possible for me to say I'm queer. It's because there were, like, dykes in these punk bands that were talking about the fact that they were dykes. And, and I thought I was the only one in the whole world. 
were there any things you particularly remember being things you thought? Yeah. You mean about Yeah, Frank, the Jewish lesbian folk singer. I came out when I was like 16 mm -hmm. in, in LA and um, well like I told you on the phone you I went my first lesbian bar you oh. were playing <laughs> it's a really embarrassing story it's really horrible um, but anyways like I was like you know wanting to listen to like girls that made music like lesbians like and I only listen to punk rock so I went to this dumb dance club and it was a horrible evening it was, a bad it was one of those um <laughs> dress up dyke bars one of those yeah it was really she she oh really and um this my friend <laughs> um my friend's <gasps> sister horrible. took us there to like she sure just had it. a cruise babes want to see what she taught us it's worked oh, really she, good over the years oh, please she taught us to <laughs> go <laughs> like this <laughs> There were a lot of girls who were like 15 to 20, and um, Frank was there, our favorite lesbian um, folk guitarist, and she had all these hundreds of girls doing the bulldagger swagger. And trying to give something back that we needed so bad when we were kids. Just that, that, you know, like like being so excited because Frank was a dyke, you know. It's like, great, and I want some little girl now to feel the same way about Lynn Breedlove from Tribe A. You know, I wanted to say, wow, she's totally cool and she likes girls, so it must be okay. I personally consider myself a femme, but nobody believes me. <laughs> it's about our power and our control as dykes, not so much whether it's David Geffen or Warner Brothers or whoever deciding anything. I don't want to hand that control over to anybody. This whole society controls each of us because we're fucking women. Like this all the time and we're over it. I think we are. Are you? I am. <laughs> so, uh, I'm a big fan. I don't own every single record, but the feeling that I got, it's just so exciting to me now to listen to Riot Girl bands. Um, to put on, there's a dike in a pit, you know, to like go out and be able to buy 45s. Um, for girls to be making music, like totally yeah. uncompromised, um, to save your pennies and um, put out a piece of vinyl that costs 45 cents a piece to make. Um, I made my first record with money that I saved from teaching swimming. That's how I made Folk Singer. Nobody helped me, nobody wanted to sign me, and I think if I had waited around, nobody would have.
it's just like the myth of it being hard is so dominant and it, it's, it's just it's so hard to dispel something that's been hammered into people's heads I'm being chaos this is our recording studio this is what it looks like that's my guitar that's me this is my new guitar oh wait like I'd ask questions like, "Oh, what is what is that light doing? What does that mean?" And they'd be like, "Oh, you know, it's nothing yeah. that you should worry about, little lady." Yeah, I don't fully. It's like, fuck you. It's like Mike in your drums and just be like, "I'm gonna put this right like, here. Is this gonna be in so way? probably right?" You know, just be like, "Oh really god!" Nice. But then that's, that makes you want to fucking oh. drum harder, though. Yeah. There was one asshole who said that I drum, I tune my drums too low. I'm like, that's my sound. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? I'm like, no, I'm, not, I'm not like you know. You know what I mean? Yeah. I'm just like, eat this! But I still get letters every day from girls that are like, totally putting themselves down about how they're not a good guitar player and how they'll never be a good guitar player and blah 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 and it's just so not true like I can't I can't believe how much music people listen to that's like independent music music by people who obviously didn't go to Guitar Institute of Technology or whatever who still really fundamentally believe that you have to be you know, Eddie Van Halen in order to start a band. I'm sorry, but I'm a lesbian and I have to use tools as much as possible. So, um, who plays? Does, any, does anyone play guitar? Okay, does anyone not play, but, but kind of think that they want to? It's like for buying a car. You wouldn't just buy a guitar, and go, a car, and go. That's great. There's things you look at, and if you don't know how to buy it, you bring a friend along, and you might go and have a diagnostic test. And I suppose it's the same way. It's like there's people shouldn't have to get ripped off by guitars, and girls shouldn't have to get ripped off by guitars. Because I think people will try and punch shit up on girls all the time because they just assume that you don't know. And maybe if you're just starting out, you don't know. You know. You know? This is like the store that like, got the black market where me and my friend go to look at guitars and stuff. And this guy is thinks that I'm his girlfriend. Even though, like he's just that's the only reason he can see me going there. Like he's always like when my friend goes down there, he's like, Where's your girlfriend? And he's like, I don't have a girlfriend. What are you talking about? You know, and he's thinking about me because he just can't see why I would want to go into the store. And it's just really stupid because like I bought a fucking pedal there. And Party and she put us on a flyer and we didn't really know we were gonna do it for real. We we didn't have a name and then we just made. You were there and Slade was there. We were so embarrassed a real musician was there. We were like mortified. We we're like Slade's here. Slade's here. Oh man, fuck Slade's here. And so we made up the songs. Me and Linny sat in my apartment and we made. I had three chords that I knew, so they were all like four songs made on three chords that all sound starting in E and all sounding a little similar. We still play those songs but not together because they might sound like the same song. And then uh, Kat joined us like the day of the party and put a drum beat to everything and then we just played it and our friends were really enthusiastic so they made us play the set, four song set, like three times over and over again. And I think it was just like a lot of dykes were ready for something like that. Did you play music when you were a child? Um, no. I played, I air guitars on, well no, I, I, like my dad played tennis and I, I, uh, I played guitar on the tennis racket and sang and pretended I was a guy in a rock band. Awesome. <laughs> So I could get the girl. I see a parade and there were marching drummers and I fell in love with the drummers. And I turned to my mom and I said, that's what I want to be. 
<laughs> took me many years since then. How old were you? I was five. I think it's the immediate experience that you were talking about, or that reality of existing in a way that is an aberration. Mm -hmm. And so when you're you're speaking your language and your truths and what you know what is going on in your reality, mm -hmm. um, it comes forth as political because it is it is radical. It's like a radical way of existing. We were on our way from Gay Pride, a Gay Pride march, to um, the show, and we got seriously harassed. I thought we were going to get beat up. I didn't know if we were going to like live because. There was a baseball game was getting out at the same time, and there were all these bars full of drunk guys, and no cops in sight. And I didn't know even if the cops showed up, if they wouldn't just join in, you know. There's a man touching a woman out there that doesn't want to be touched. Uh, let's point the guy out. But it it got really scary, and we got away. But I just wanted to get into that show. I just wanted to get into that space because I knew even if there were asshole guys there, if things got really bad, I could be like, hey, you know you know, and yell something out and get their attention if I had to and something would be done about it and it would be done with authority because the people up on the stage would be like, yeah. look, do something <laughs> about this. If you're a woman or a dyke, you can never just simply be entertained. You always, everywhere you go in public, you have to, like you're confronted by who you are. A lot of us, I think, we have to like educate ourselves and, and each we other. No, we don't know what's gone on before, and that's part of the problem because we're repeating the same kind of it's just a the same arguments, and that's part of what the dominant culture wants. They mm -hmm. want us not to be informed and not to have a history for ourselves. Of. To me, to, for someone to say an all-black rock band is really redundant because of the roots, basically, yeah, of, right. of rock and roll. And Inside the black community too, you feel like it's great. If you listen to this stuff, you're like, God, you know, and I had to go through that of playing my punk black flag, you know, really, really loudly and have like these teenage girls knock on my door and say, What the hell? Yeah, you like all this stuff. And it's about what I like. All the riot girl bands and stuff talk about punk as being like this straight white male dominated scene. That is our appropriation of the hardcore formula which we feel will ensure, you know, a money-making career with the queer community in 1996. Okay, now this song is, you know, sarcastic satire but serious, you know, and it's kind of about, you know, punk as a white thing and punk is a racist thing and the world is a, you know, a white dominated place and all that kind of bullshit. And it's about like being sick of hearing the same old bullshit from acquaintances and maybe even some friends and exiting them out of your life is now punk. No. Okay. Ready? Every time race came up, it would, like tension rose. You could feel it, and it was an apprehension. I think mostly it was an apprehension about discussing it at all because nobody knew what to do with it because mm -hmm. mostly most of the women in the group are white. The it things fucks it up. you know, the things that I do, mm -hmm. I'm continually like calling people on whatever shit, like just uh -huh. by saying I am what I am or whatever, that itself not being is invisible. setting up ripples mm -hmm. like of, you know, whatever, I think this anxiety in some cases yeah. and, and positive, like where people are getting more and more relaxed and talking about certain things in the classroom and outside of the classroom that before would never Or they would be talked about as if nobody in the room was a, a, pr a participant in the right. oppression. You know, this happens all the time in, not, and it's, not just in the university system, but in like me sitting down and talking to people in the music scene or in um, my woman's community or whatever, where 
it's like this thing where, well, you know, we're all white and middle class, and who are we to? And then it's like this completely making invisible anybody in the room. Like, okay, you might be the minority in the room, you might be a dyke, you might be a person of color, you might be from a working class, welfare class background, but you're assumed invisible because you're the minority. You can't, you can't sit back and, and expect people of color to tell you about racism. <laughs> you know, right. it's exactly. That's the problem I had with WAC, too. Exactly. Because that's how we were put in this, there was this little subgroup called Committee on Diversity and Inclusion, like even the acronym. It was like, let's not even talk about race. Let's try to make it into this generic corporate sounding thing. <laughs> this punk scene and you make, it, it, as well you should never make assumptions in life, but it's the kind of thing where sometimes you can't help it and then you're knocked on the head and you realise, but, you know, the, the racism that's involved and the homophobia and the sexism, which everybody knows about, I'm not telling anybody anything new, but like, you know, the fact that you would have, you know, um, the punk rock record store that carries uh, a certain straight edge label that has basically Nazis on it and like has all this racist, xenophobic kind of advertising or lyrics to the band sing. People apologise for racism, like, oh, well, I'm sorry about this, or I'm sorry about that, and it's like, nobody really wants to hear the punches, they like, stuff them up your hole, really. It's like, you know, it's like, actually speak louder than words. It seems to be, at least the mainstream queer movement, seems to be totally moving away from that, and just being into, like, oh, we can be, you know, look, the capitalists are accepting us, and look, you know, people are accepting us into their fucked up way of thinking, instead of, we want to fuck things up. <laughs> yeah. So. I was gay bashed with my girlfriend, not like on Church Street, which is very close to the Castro, and people stood there and watched. So, I mean, I would not say that it's just like this happy little, you know, laugh under heaven. And oh my God! You know, like you get those looks. Self-defense demo with Team Dresh, how did it come about? Um, I think it was a whole bunch of things at one time. Uh, Jody was working on Free to Fight a lot, and I helped out with that a little bit. And um, and she had also gotten beaten up at a, one of the first Team Dress shows, um, where she got she got attacked, and she dealt with the legal system and how totally unhelpful they were with that, um, her being a dyke and all. But it, it just got to the point, I think after I was gay bash, it was like my reality check because I just realized that, you know, as Audrey Lord, Audrey Lord said, your silence will not protect you. <laughs> Then like they're, so they see the demo and then they're thinking about like, well first of all they're aware of their more aware maybe of their circumstances there where they are, at that show, which a lot of times those places aren't safe. They're not made safe for women and so already like the safety maybe increases and then but also just the awareness of like power and fighting in a really physical way and then you watch the music and. Like how, you know, it's, I think it maybe it would be easier to see like when a woman is like screaming over a microphone 
like she's using her whole body and to be able to do that that's not something that you know we learn at the age of three like we learn to be quiet you know so all of a sudden you just like you can see the social barriers that are being broken down and you know a woman like playing a guitar really hard is like this physical act you know you can turn around and take a guitar and hit somebody with it you know you can pick up a microphone and hit somebody with it and people do that all the time and so all of a sudden these things this music and these instruments become tools and weapons you know and um, and our voice and I think it's like the self-defense was like this metaphor or something for like what is already happening and so for me it's like um, just sh just kind of pointing out a little bit to to women who are already doing really intense things that what like how powerful what they're doing can be you know well we want to get into this scene or cultivate this sound or we have this big plan and this is what we want to do and it wasn't like that at all it was just like ha ha let's have fun and you know be stupid and just enjoy that and um <laughs> not worth it to be able to say no if you can't go out and get what you want you know mm. you know what I'm saying and I think that um, that's what, you know, a queer identity is about, too. You know, it's like not just about all this like political bullshit, it's like about how we have sex, you know? Promoting SM, uh, um, we're telling men to beat up on their old ladies. Yeah. Or by her taking her shirt off means that because we play to mixed audiences that are men and women, that if she takes off her shirt, it's for men to objectify her only. Yeah, because I want men to look See, at my tits. It's kind of scary. Like, we're going you can't do anything right, though, because you're, you're going to offend someone. Oh, we're not going to change our show. I mean, no, I know. I think. We're going, I know. No, but we're going to play, yeah. we're going to play in yeah. Virginia next week, and part of the deal was that Linny had to promise not to take off her shirt. I mean, and that's... Mm -hmm. like, but they didn't say that? anything <laughs> about me pulling out bloody tampons, <laughs> masturbating, licking Leslie's snatch with my head under her skirt. They didn't <laughs> say nothing. <laughs> I couldn't do that. See, so I was like, okay. I'll keep my clothes on. No problem. I don't be, know yet. It'll be, it'll be, <laughs> she hasn't what done is this going to happen? I'll just <laughs> get her by surprise. Yeah. Just wear a skirt. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But she did ask no me to one. wear a skirt at that show. <laughs> she did. <laughs> <laughs> I'll just pretend. I won't lick it. <laughs> lick it, you wore. <laughs> lick it, you wore. <laughs> lick it. It's something where you say, does this feel good to me, or do I want this to stop? Right. Like you know, with tattooing, that kind of gets iffy, because you're like, oh, Lord, please hurry up. You know what I mean? But it's something that you're putting yourself through willingly, mm. you know? It's not like if somebody is kicking your ass, right. you know, and you just, you're not, totally not loving it. You know what I mean? You wish yeah. it would be over, like gay bashing. Historically, that whenever homosexuality gets talked about, it's 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 gay men that are being talked about, and that lesbians have been completely invisible and considered non-sexual creatures. That basically you're a lesbian because you're asexual, because you're inept, you're impotent, you can't fuck. It's hard to resist a sweet young thing with a wandering eye and a body of sin. When she walks by, looking so damn fine, I know I can outdo any man. Any. The song itself, it's just it's about such a, uh, an important part I think of the les lesbian culture and. Um, and like, I don't know, the attitude in Chicken Hawk, that kind of s sexual attitude about 
being queer that's not, it's not about politics, really, it's about sex, it's about desire. Boy, I fucked your girlfriend, I fucked your girl. Boy, I fucked your girlfriend, her ass in a world. Boy, I fucked your girlfriend, you should have heard the noise. Boy, I fucked your girlfriend, and she is done with boys. Yes, she is done with boys. What's considered political, is that real? Why is it only if, if a white guy is like in a suit standing on a podium talking to you why is that what's political and that's what's getting things done it's like people saying oh we don't need any more love songs it's like well maybe you don't but i do <laughs> you know i don't have enough love songs for my experiences i don't have enough girl heroes in my face you know? Everybody kind of has touched on the idea of, you know, okay, well, there's nothing out there that I can relate to, so I'm just going to create it. I'm just going to be it, you know. I'm going to pretend like the revolution's already happened and I'm just existing how I am and who I am. expect more sheer numbers, you know, um, and I, and I think, and for that to happen, like, I think there really has to be, like, a, a, gr a grassroots, a ground level, other girls teaching other girls, other girls telling other girls how easy it is, other girls helping each other girls out, you know what I mean? Because, you know, basically other people aren't going to do it for you, your parents are going to think you're a lunatic, or, you know, people are going to think you're a freak, I mean, when I started playing guitar, all the other kids thought I was a freak anyway, so I didn't have to tell you, you know, and, uh, but it's, it's like, I think that's why, like, you know, it's encouraging when, you know, there's like, next week there's going to be a basic guitar workshop for girls. Oh, well, I, it's helpful to probably other young ladies who are thinking of starting a ladies' lesbian orchestra to know that, See? you know, it's a process like anything else in your life. <laughs> Today I have tri date. Great, have a talk show. Um, are we are we rolling? <laughs> I'm just a ham. Um, that would make sense. You know what? I don't even like this, the sentence trying to do things. Girls succeeding at doing things. Yeah. Is bad. Like zines and movies, videos like this one that Lucy is making, and um, records, CDs, tapes, shows, and girls who are doing it because they want to meet other girls and be with other girls and communicate with other girls and not just like saying, uh, Hi, I'm here, I'm going to make a million dollars and, you know, be on David Letterman or whatever, for no particular reason. I guess the girl culture has a reason for existence.
what's your goal in life? And I'm like sweaty and hyperactive and I'm like, my goal is for every 13-year-old girl to have a poster of me up in the wall and their mother's going to be worried that their daughter's a dyke. <laughs> <laughs>